From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Alexis Codename Doc Holiday Jackson. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. And we want to welcome some very special guests. Every Thursday, we are immensely fortunate to do something uh, that we call Listener Mail because, spoiler, that's what it is. No bait and switch here. Uh, we've got uh, we've got a bevy of amazing correspondence. We're going to learn a little bit about meditation, physical manifestation. We're going to learn about mind over matter in terms of what you can make your brain and your nervous and hormonal system do by the power of thought alone. And before we get into any of that, thought it might be fun to answer a little question. Might need some help around robining this from a person who wrote an email to us that made me say, what in the Sam Hill? Because that's the name they're going by, Sam Hill. Yeah, that's really great. I, I mean, you know, you wrote that, Sam. That's all praise that's and you. credit to you. Yeah. Who was it a favorite nickname of ours? Frank Lloyd Wrong. I saw that on a TV show a couple of days ago. Pretty sure they grabbed it from that. Might have been parallel thinking, but I was like, that's, that's that. That was great. Well, let's hear from Sam Hill. And here's Sam. Sam says, I'm a longtime listener who has always wondered if I would ever have a reason to write. Well, I found one. You can read this on the show if you choose and refer to me as Sam Hill. Done and done, bro. Uh, Sam says, I don't know if you have covered this topic in depth in a previous show, but I couldn't find one if you did. Sam is kind of following up on some of the questions we raise with real estate and farming. Uh, Sam says, I grew up on a family farm in central Wisconsin. I recently took my girlfriend on a tour of the area where I grew note, where I grew up, noting all the changes in the 36 years since I left the farm life and moved to the city. The only building still intact was the house we lived in. Unfortunately, Sam, that's an uh, experience that's going to be common to a lot of us, your faithful correspondents included. Sam says, I moved away in 1987 to pursue music in the city. Sam, the first few times I read this, I swear, man, I thought you said I moved away in 1987 to pursue magic in the city. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is about to twist. But anyway, so Sam continues and says, uh, when I went to college, I was turned down for any financial aid of any kind because my parents whoosh, whoosh, made too much money as farmers. And then two years later, my family lost the farm due to financial hardships. Sam points out this is another bigger discussion that needs to happen around farm subsidies. Uh, so he says, also, the neighbor down the road from us bought our farm at an auction and took it over. I don't recall what we had at the for acreage at the time. We had 480 acres in the mid-70s, got as high as 840 acres in the heyday. Wow. Yeah, big operation. And the neighbor who bought their land had an even larger farm. And so with that background, Sam says, fast forward back to now. So we're back to the future with Sam. Sam says, I found out while visiting with my family that the neighbor who owned all that land recently sold it to China. I was both stunned and saddened to think that my childhood home had been sold to interest outside of the United States. Whatever the amount of acreage involved, I assure you it was significant. It's also an extremely large milk producing dairy farm. And I see online, says Sam, that Congress is currently discussing the rampant buying of American farmland by China. My question is, how is this even allowed to happen to begin with? Would I be able to just buy up land in China? Our land was used for growing corn, wheats, oats, soybeans, etc. Is the food grown there now shipped to China or do they sell it here? Do they qualify for the same subsidies as domestic farmers? I would love to know more about the background on how this is allowed to happen, as well as what Congress might do to stop this from happening. Spoiler, Sam, not much. Uh, in short, can you tell me what in the Sam Hill is going on? Isn't this just a question of capitalism? Like our country is just like, yes, buy whatever, sell whatever. But countries like China, Russia, other countries in the world are more nationalistic. Well, OK, but. I, I think there might be an error here because I don't think that farm 
was sold to quote China. It was probably right. sold to Chinese interest, uh, you know, uh, private companies that maybe operate out of China or are owned in China. Yeah, and that's a really great point, Matt. Um, you're a mind reader, dude. That's where we start because the government, quote unquote, of China or the uh, the People's Republic, they're not going to be buying a lot of stuff directly. That doesn't make sense. Uh, it could be a state-owned proxy company or an investment firm. It's much more likely, however, that it could be a non wholly owned state subsidiary. It could be a very wealthy individual who wants to find a safe place to park their money. And that is definitely something that we are going to see on the uptick now because the nation of China is in countering some dangerous storm clouds on the horizon. It's not just the bill of the one child policy coming due. There is a lot of, there are many economic plot twists ahead uh, and wish the people of that country the best of luck with those. Uh, so yeah, you're absolutely spot on, man. It's probably not the big government of China. It's not like Xi Jinping is slamming the kitchen table going, I need more milk. And oats and <laughs> soybeans. Um, maybe he is. I don't know. I, I've never hung out with him. <laughs> it would be a smart move to control the manufacturing of food in, mm -hmm. you know, a rivaling country. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is why, which is why there's such a double, double edged sword or devil edged sword. Uh, if we want to keep the misspeak there uh, to farm subsidies in general. But there's another question Sam asked and Sam, it's, fascinating that we we haven't addressed this uh in more depth in in previous episodes or listener mail segments sam says something very reasonable can i just go buy land in china you know if exactly. i have sam hill if i like if i have a couple hundred mil can i just roll up somewhere and uh say i'm gonna buy this village well, I mean, you know, to travel to other countries, you have to have certain credentials and certain bona fides and like visas and things like that to get a job. So one would think to purchase land that would benefit your personal portfolio, you would have to have something similar, right? Yeah. And it gets, it can get pretty dicey because as, uh, as mentioned earlier here, there are many countries that do not really allow foreigners to own property or real estate. And a big part of that is the shadow of imperialism and colonialism. The world learned how that can go wrong right now. And this may be astonishing for some of us. There's no what you could call land ownership or freehold owning land in China the way there is in the U.S. and a lot of the West. All of the urban land in the nation of China is owned by the Chinese government, like right out by the Chinese government. You can get these leases on this state-owned land, and uh, if you go outside of the city, if you try to buy that farm, for instance, what you'll find is all suburban and all rural or agricultural land is owned by collectives, local groups of farmers. It's called collective land. So let's assume you're a Chinese national. You can say, hey, can I get a lease on this land? And they'll lease it to you. Uh, can I use it for something? Can I grow, you know, uh, can I grow soybeans or et cetera on this land? Then, yeah. But when they allow you to use it, when they allow you to lease it, you cannot transfer ownership of it. So if you have leased, like if you're a real estate magnet, magnate and you have leased uh, the land to build a huge apartment complex, you can't really sell it because it's not really yours. It's changing a little bit. I think it was in 2019, uh, there was a law passed that allows rural collectives to transfer, I guess, not even ownership, but transfer the ability to use land for certain things like, Hey, you can grow, you know, potatoes here. Just remember it's not really yours. And for people in the U S that can seem, that can seem very strange. Totalitarian kind of, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I was looking at <laughs> with your question, Sam, it kind of turned me into a, a dog with a ball. Uh, 
it's kind of difficult to get citizenship in China and getting citizenship would allow you to participate in this lease scheme. Uh, China is actually, if you're in the West, China is one of the most difficult countries when it comes to citizenship. It's like Vatican City, Liechtenstein, Bhutan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, China, and, you know, all the hits like North Korea or Iran. Uh, it, it's going to be much more expensive than buying land here in the United States. And that barrier to entry is 100 percent on purpose. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I would have assumed. But to, to the listener's point and question, are there opportunities elsewhere for that? And what are the benefits? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, as I said earlier, there are a lot of countries that do almost entirely to the concerns of colonialism and other exploitative systems, they have just said, look, if you are not from here, you don't own land here. Uh, But of course, money moves and there are ways around this. It is not uncommon, for example, for uh, wealthy Westerners to relocate to Thailand and then get a business partner or get a, a spouse or something and then have the land in that spouse's name, right? And just hope their relationship works out or hope their business partner uh, keeps it 100 with them the entire time. That adds a level of risk that is not present in U.S. real estate. Mm. I know there's some stuff going on. We talked about it before with Saudi Arabia, right? Where there Mm. were nationals buying up expensive properties in large, like bulk rates, basically, But there was also some recent reporting out of CBS News about a Saudi Arabian company buying up land. I want to say it was in the Southwest, like Arizona, Nevada, those areas. And they were accessing aquifer water, Mm -hmm. water that was deep below. And they were just pulling it out of the ground for uses that were not necessarily for like an American company or something like that. I I don't know what I'm... You're you're 100% right. Yet again, Matt, what you're talking about is Fondo Monte. Fondo Monte is uh, a company, is how the shell game works. It's a company that's owned by another big dairy company that is, of course, owned in practice by the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, by, by the House of Saud. You're absolutely right. It was Western Arizona. They bought a ton of land there, not necessarily to grow anything, but to practice resource extraction of the groundwater aquifer because. In that part of the U.S., there are absolutely no regulations on how much water can be pumped out of the ground. Nestle must be so pissed right now. Yeah, like we, we should have figured that one out. No, you figured out our game is what Nestle says. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it, it, again, my, my, my original point was like capitalism. It's like our whole system is based on like resource extraction, paying for resources paying for commodities like and the system is so behind the new data about how this is actually very bad for life on this planet and not to mention the lobbies and stuff that are like trying to keep it in the old way but it's just really hard to walk it back you know so i think the fact that anyone from any country can buy land here makes sense it tracks for the way we do business yeah i would agree with that and And Sam, I would agree with you as well that there is an unsustainable discrepancy here. And you hit on two points that are simply going to become more and more important as the years while on, unless the religious folks are right about that red cow that we we discussed earlier this week. Right now, what we would love to do would love to hear from people who have firsthand experience with struggling family farms. Tell us the the real deal about this. Uh, We would also love to hear your experience with foreign investors in real estate. Or, hey, if if you have a story to tell, tell us about your experience as a non-native somewhere in the world participating in the real estate game. Because, again, my understanding is it gets much, much easier the more money you have. one 833 stdwytk conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsor, and we'll be back with more messages from you. (laughs) 
And we're back. We are going to hear a little story here from an anonymous person that I am going to, guys, I'm going to give this person uh, a nickname at the end. But I'm mm. going to wait until we hear the phrase mm, within the story. Right, yeah. Hello. Okay. Hello. <laughs> here we go. And Anonymous writes, Hi, guys. Long time listener. First time sharer. I wanted to share with you a, quote, supernatural story that happened to me and my three-year-old son this past Tuesday on 9-5. I think that you may find it interesting. Before I start, I just want to point out that I've had multiple supernatural encounters since I was a little boy growing up in my parents' house, from seeing full-bodied apparitions to hearing disembodied voices and objects moving. I guess seeing objects moving. So I'm no stranger to otherworldly encounters. I was listening to your podcast on Is Reality a Simulation? And I figured this was the push I needed to share this. My wife, who is of Jewish faith and I, of Catholic faith, have our religious views. We both tend to fall more into spiritualism and focus on meditation and letting the universe guide us. We often listen to various manifestations and reality shift meditations and are strong believers in the multiverse. Sorry for this info dump. Let me dive into the story. To note, my wife was at work since 8 a.m. and my seven-year-old son was at school, so only my three-year-old and I were in the house. While taking a break from my work, my three-year-old son and I were playing a game of cat and mouse. Interesting. I've never played a game of cat and mouse with my kid. Well, is that like chase or I you guess know, so. tag yeah, or hide, this must be a cultural seek. thing. It's yeah, a yeah, more exactly. active hide yep. and seek. 100%. Uh, to continue, while running down the hall toward my three-year-old's room, I passed my bedroom. Out of the corner of my eye, I could have sworn I saw my wife sitting up on our bed. A human-shaped figure against a white leathery headboard is kind of hard to miss. Now, obviously knowing that she was not at home and aware of the fact that I was running through the hallway, I kept going and chalked it up to my eyes playing tricks. However, not five seconds later, my three-year-old runs into his brother's room, that's my seven-year-old who's at school, and says out loud and as clear as day, Aha! There you are! I got you, mama! I kid you not. When he said those words, my face dropped. I walked into the other room and said, Baby, what did you say? Being three, his attention span is as good as a fly's, and he comes running over for a hug. I said to him, why did you say I got you mama? And he said, I saw mama. Now, I've seen enough horror ghost movies in my life to know that this usually means something ominous. I immediately call my wife and ask her if she's okay, to which she responded that everything was fine. I explained the story, and she told me that she was on her lunch break and really was wishing she was back home napping. Uh, She said she was in her car, and before I called, she had just finished doing a reality shift meditation. Okay, can we take a pause real quick? What is a reality shift meditation? This is a style of meditation, let's say like a guided meditation usually that exists. It's very common now, especially you can find it on TikTok, Instagram, places like that. Uh, YouTube, there are, there are like 10 minute, 20 minute guided meditations for reality shifting. The concept here, at least to my understanding, is that you can alter your reality, the reality that is surrounding you or the one that you are operating in, your avatar, you can change that by focusing on the changes you wish to see. That's mm. that's the concept, right? But it goes deeper to where some people think you're physically shifting timelines. Mm-hmm. It gets into multiverse theory where theoretically there are an infinite number of Matt Fredericks and Noel Browns and Ben Bolins and we can like change cancers in anthem in anthem. Yeah. Yes. By location. Yeah. It's a whole thing. It's all back. It of also badgers. sounds like mentally forcing an acid trip or something kind of to a certain degree. No matter what you are, you are using your mind. You're like focusing and shaping your mind to kind of change the way you maybe see things because of what you want to see. Right. Yeah. Um, it's more like shifting perspective, in my opinion, than actually shifting realities. But yeah, it's it's a psychological transcendence. Uh, the the difference between this and the idea of um, forcing um, an acid trip or, or creating um, uh, a psychedelic experience in your own mind, which is totally possible, uh, is that in this case, our person who for now is anonymous 
saw the results, which would not happen with a with a self induced meditation, and continues to say, uh, "We came to the conclusion that this was her manifestation coming through, and that in another reality she was home with us, getting a chance to nap." She manifested nap time. Well, but like physically across time and space and into her bedroom and then into her one of her son's rooms hanging out. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's finish up the message here from Anonymous. We've been doing these types of manifestations for about two years now. Nothing like this has happened before. I do not believe there's some entity in my house. In the six years we've been there, nothing out of the normal has happened again. I know this is a lot to read and I'm sorry for the info dump. Just wanted to share this Never. little nugget of weirdness. Agreed. Never. <laughs> uh, and then thank you. Anonymous, AKA white leather headboard. Uh, that's that to me leather really headboard. It stood out to me so much. This mm -hmm. image oh my God, yes. of his leathery white headboard yeah. on his bed. I was like, what kind of bed like, do you have? I like that it's uh, leathery alligator. and not yeah. leather, you know? So shout out to you, W-L-H. Uh, send, <laughs> send us a pic. Is it creepy for us, us to ask for a picture of the bedroom? Like, nope. uh, <laughs> which, like Well, there's a reason because see, knowing where uh, the kid is running, like knowing how it looks from the hallway, you know, encounters peripheral vision, et cetera, et cetera. Matt, I got to tell you, honestly, um, I practice a lot of meditation, so I'm a little biased on this one. I also read a lot of weird stuff. So I, I have to recuse myself by simply saying, I don't think uh, science has the answers. And I'm going to stand by that. Well, that's a, I mean, that's a pretty good answer in my opinion. I've done some experimentations with astral travel attempts, let's say, with that, those kinds of things. We've been, we've been covering this for so long. I'm sure we've tried a number of things that we don't even tell each other about because honestly, they're a little weird. I mean, I, I, you know, they, they interest us. And for me personally, there's a bit of a fear if I told you guys some of the weird junk I've attempted no <laughs> worries, associated Matt. with our episodes. Matt, you know the uh, you know the past of my family, so it's like I'm pretty sure that if you if you describe something, even if I didn't know exactly what it was, I would probably just back you up. I'd be like, yeah, you know, give it a shot. Who knows? Don't hurt anybody. But what I would say is, I have had experiences in a meditative state where. It feels as though I am somewhere else. My consciousness is in another physical location, and I feel as though I am observing things that are occurring in that location. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that sounds really weird, and I'm using the phrase I feel as though because that is how I experience <laughs> the human it. way of expressing it. Well, that's you know? how I experience it. Yeah, I, exactly. It doesn't mean that I'm actually there, but wow, what if you could? Well, mm. I have a really good friend who... I knew in like middle school, but he was older than me and was like a really cool artist guy. And then I sort of reconnect with him later in life. And he is this filmmaker and really into like astrophysics and like psychedelic stuff. But he's never been like a heavy drug user. But the first couple of times we hung out like later in life, he just told me unequivocally that he astral projects all the time and like really believes it. And I it really was the first time that I was forced to question my judgment about something like that, where I was like, he believes it. He's saying it in such a matter of fact way. I'm like, how could I possibly call this man a liar? You know what I mean? Like I, I, that, that's, that's rude at the very least disrespectful at the very most. And I was just like, it really made me rethink, you know, and I don't think he's mentally ill. He's a very functional, creative person, you know? And, uh, and I, I was just really taken by how much he expressed it with such confidence. Hmm. Well, we're certainly not the only ones, uh, neither is uh, White Leather Headboard and, and his spouse. There are people out there all over the planet right now experimenting with this stuff, attempting this stuff. Some people taking it a lot more seriously than others, right? Like mm -hmm. choosing to focus on this as almost a study uh, or to incorporate it in part of their lives as something they do every day, the, the, maybe a you could compare it to prayer, like everyday prayer kind of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. I right? love that. Yeah. yeah that's great. That's smart. Or even waking up and reading a newspaper, like that kind of ritual that it's a ritual lot of people of have. Any kind. Yeah, for sure. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know me, man. I, I place some importance on ritual. I think it's it's important in um, just lives as individuals, and it, it echoes up. It resonates upward into social dynamics of groups. So if you have if you have rituals that aren't harming people, and uh, you you run into someone who's uh, to your point, Noel, being rude or disrespectful about it, just keep it moving. Don't worry about them. Uh, Agreed. Because they're they're their own problem. I, I do want to, there is a cool note uh, that this reminds me, Matt, of a, a, a great quote from the band Tool, for anybody who's a fellow Tool fan, uh, the frontman Maynard James Keenan said once, he said, yeah, it's, you know, you can take psychedelic drugs and get to this amazing mind state, but that just shows you where you want to go. And the real, the real discipline is to get there without the crutches, uh, mm. and, which I think is a, is a pretty fascinating and noble thing. And it sounds like WLH, it sounds like you're well on the way. Would love to hear more of these stories. I love that. Just that. It's not a flex. It was to tell us that the headboard was white so that, you know, the difference in the color and like shadow you'd notice in your periphery. Very man, well written. Yeah, just, I agree. Just be like, yeah, my... Uh, White leather headboard. <laughs> Red sorry. leather, yellow leather. Red leather, yellow leather. All right. Uh, well, that's it for now. We'll be right back with more messages from you. And we're back with one final piece of listener mail. And it's very apropos uh, to what we've been talking about this whole episode, the idea of controlling your own headspace, controlling your own experiential sort of like bubble. Um, I'll get right into it. This comes from, I'm going to call them Rice because they didn't give us permission to name them. Hello. A few years ago during COVID, I moved back into my parents' house to pursue a degree. I was turning 30, a difficult time to decide to uproot a career, a humbling experience. However, forever grateful to the amazing parents I have and for their understanding and willingness to help my move forward in this roller coaster of a life. During that time, my father recommended your podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Um, I've been hooked ever since. You have helped me through breakups, panic attacks, life transitions, and much more. So from the bottom of my heart, I deeply feel when I say this that I'm speaking for many. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is a very kind thing to say. And we usually don't read these kinds of like things, parts of the emails, but I, I just thought it was very well written and I appreciate it. Um, with that being said, I think this topic deserves some research as it might be considered taboo, but I believe is tangible and is possibly explainable to one degree or another. I have been able to release adrenaline voluntarily. I'm not sure when I realized that I was able to do so or have invested thought into the origin. I'm not exactly sure how I do it, and I don't do it often as it can feel physically detrimental. Having said that, I have dealt with panic attacks and anxiety throughout my younger life. I know what adrenaline feels like. In a typical fight or flight response, the body prepares itself to, well, flight or fight. It does so by dumping adrenaline. Not a great feeling. However, when not in a panic mode, I'm able to dump adrenaline without the anxiety or panic and I'm able to discern that it is merely a physical response without all the mental turmoil. If it interests you all, I'd love a deeper dive. Well, I think it's worthy of a deeper dive beyond just this conversation, but it's so interesting that adrenaline can be experienced by a human as like I'm pumped. I'm I'm stoked. I'm 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 ready to go. You know, that, that's one use of adrenaline. And some people, you know, spend a lot of money to take drugs that do that very thing for them, you know, amphetamines and whatever it might be. So it is for me interesting to think about, yeah, adrenaline is kind of a negative thing, but it also is a thing that in the history of humanity is a thing that makes you realize you need to run away. Man, guys, I don't know enough about the science here, but for me, I've been ex I've experienced the high adrenaline thing when when I've been extremely nervous, like a Ooh. state of oh, I don't know what I would call it, uh, hypervigilance kind of thing, where I can feel myself almost shake like tremors, like minor tremors, where I'm like but focused on something, and it is I I completely agree with Rice here. It's a terrible feeling when sure. you're in that state right it is almost it's almost fear maybe it is fear because associated with fight or flight like we're talking about but a physical sensation of it 
I, I am fascinated to know what it would be like to have that chemical flow through you when you're in the mindset, uh, in a different mindset, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like that when you sounds, feel in control of it, right? Yeah. It sounds like a superpower to me, like, like mutant X-Men level <laughs> style where I can re- release adrenaline and do like <laughs> stupendous feats that I couldn't it's, do with my it's body. It's funny you say that there's a sci-fi series that's absolutely about that. One of the principal characters has the ability that you're describing rice, which is to activate his adrenaline for a very short amount of time to allow him to accomplish extraordinary feats of strength. Like when you hear about the mom lifting the car up to save her kid, there's a great stuff you should know about that. Currently the science says that um, there is no proven case of a human being consciously releasing adrenaline or other chemicals of this nature without taking physical action or having like a panic attack or something like that, everyone can release adrenaline through extreme activities, you know, roller coasters. And I guess the last thing to add, of course, it's fight, flight, or freeze. Unfortunately, a lot of people freeze. That's why so many high stakes training scenarios depend so heavily on muscle memory. For sure. And um, my, my kid, recently because of some neurodivergent type stuff was given a waiver through the school system to have a little more time for tests and things like that. And we just discussed the other day how much of a difference it's made. Just the knowing that you have a little more time has made them not go into freeze mode. Just the knowing has made them not go into freeze mode. And it like, you know, cause it's easy as a parent to be like, Oh, they're just lazy. They just don't want to do the work, but like, it is real. Like anxiety, adre- these kinds of things are very, very real. So this was a very big deal conversation we had because I was like, Oh, okay. I really get it. Like the way they explained it was like, this is a functional thing that you have helped me attain. And I, I also think it's interesting with this uh, listener that adrenaline junkies, the idea of people that are adrenaline seekers, that's a thing. So that's why mm-hmm. I was sort of struggling with it's in, inherently negative because I think some people think they, they thrive on adrenaline. Oh, yeah. I know it can be great. I Gosh, I was going to tell a personal story. It can be great for me when I'm playing drums if I get a little bit of that feeling mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then I feel like I could play drums for forever. You know, but if, if I'm not, I can tire out super easy. So like, man, I wish mm, it does make me wish I had this button. Let's do it guys. Let's develop an adrenaline uh, control mechanism. (laughs) All right. I'll text Pfizer back. Um, (laughs) Just get back on DARPA's Instagram. They are going to need to make some money. With all mm-hmm. those drugs coming off the shelves. That's right. They are yeah. They are in the hole. We should help them out. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you think, guys? For sure. There's a there's a question I have for you, Rice. I would love to, um, while being respectful of your time and your, um, your anonymity and comfort level, I would love to hear what your process is, what your ritual is for experiencing this feeling. Are there physical things you do? Like, you know, the old canard about how People are stronger if they put their arms on their hips, akimbo, a word I never get to use, or is it more of a mental process? And if so, is that mental process ritualized or is it just like, you know, like Matt said, is it just the mental version of a switch that you can flip kind of like how flexing your jaw can make your ears click for some people? These are very interesting questions. I, I, I would love to learn more personally. Oh, same. And it, it makes me think of there's a really great X-Men adjacent uh, television series called uh, Legion, where it really kind of flips the script of mutant powers into a mental health kind of more like, you know, what, what we know about psychology and things like that. And I think it's a really well done show. But a lot of the way the powers are portrayed in that show is about a mental ability to control things in the body that are like usually automatic. And I think that's a very interesting perspective. So with that, I think it's time to end today's episode. What do you think, fellas? Agreed. Thank you. Not just to Anon, not just to our pal, 
leathery headboard, <laughs> not just not just a rice, uh, but to all the other folks who take the time out of your day, including you, Sam Hill, uh, or your evening to to share your stories with us, but more importantly, with your fellow conspiracy realists. We are immensely grateful. And uh, picture me as some sort of a uh, non-human version of that Uncle Sam propaganda poster pointing at you, where the eyes follow you wherever you walk. We want you to join stuff they don't want you to know. And we try to make it easy to do so. So share your stories and tell us uh, your experience. We find it invaluable. Oh, you can join so easily by following us at the Handle Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, Facebook, and uh, Twitter, nay, X, whatever the hell it's called. Hey, do you want to call us? one eight three three S T D W Y T K. It's a voicemail system. We can't wait to hear your stories. When you call in, you've got three minutes. Say whatever you'd like. Just do please give yourself a cool nickname we can put in our system and we'll know who you are next time you call in. Put the number in your phone if you call in in case you get a call back. You won't think it's just some random 800 number. Uh, and let us know if we can use your message and voice in one of these listener mail episodes. Hey, if you got more to send than can fit in that three minutes, why not instead send us a good old-fashioned email? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.